I want us to go on a crazy journey. Come along. The year 2000, the month September. You are a 27-year-old Kenyan man who has just been awarded a French government scholarship to go and study tourism. And so, you pack your bags and leave. However, a month later, on November, you start to feel that there's a group of people, mostly of North African Arab origin in Lyon, specifically following and spying on you. So you do what everyone else would do, contact the police. 911, what's your emergency? The French police, however, say they cannot help you because you have no physical injuries or proof that you're being followed. Your fears keep increasing and you call them once again, but the answer is still the same. Oh, hell no! The group of people still keep following you and so you call the French police for a third time. Are you kidding me? And the answer is still the same. You have no proof that you're being followed, nor do you have physical injuries. At this point, you are living in fear and you decide you cannot take it anymore, so you decide to head back home. To fly to Kenya from France, you have first to fly to London and then from London to Nairobi, Kenya. At Lyon airport before flying to London, you once again contact the French police but still, no one is taking you seriously. This announcement is for customers to London Gatwick. On landing at Gatwick airport, in London, once more you notify the security personnel that you are being followed and that you are scared of flying to Nairobi. This time, someone listens. You are given a security escort to the aircraft and told the safest place you can be is in the aircraft. And for a moment, your worries are gone. Well, that wouldn't be for long because a few hours into the flight, the people seated in front of you and behind you start to threaten that they will kill you. I will look for you. I will find you, and I will kill you. And that is when you realize the group that had been following you in France are still following you to Kenya. Is it that you have something special that's why they want to kill you badly? What's going on? In a state of panic, you rush towards the cockpit and find only the co-pilot inside. Surprise, motherfucker! With adrenaline rushing through your body, you attack him and take charge of the control wheel. This disconnects the autopilot, causing the aircraft to climb sharply and stall from 42,000 feet, that is 13,000 meters, and plunge towards the ground at 30,000 feet. You have only one thing in your mind right now, to crash the plane and end this once and for all. The co-pilot is still wrestling with you for controls and the struggle is joined by the captain. But still, they can't take you off the control wheel. Suddenly, a 6 foot 7 inch man who was in the company of another man entered the cockpit. Whatever game you're playing, it won't work. You can't defeat me. No, I know. <sighs> but he can't. The men are not in cabin uniform. Is he here to kill you? The man tackles you to the ground. The co-pilot takes back control of the plane and is able to return the aircraft to level flight. The next thing you remember is you landing at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Nairobi. We just landed at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport here and the Kenyan police are at the airport. Maybe the police are here for the men who want you dead? Nope, they are here for you. The press, the passengers, they are all calling you a hijacker. But the group of men who want you dead are missing. So what's going on here? The story I gave you was from Paul's eye. Let's see the same story from a different perspective. The date is 29th and British Airways flight 2069 was scheduled to fly from London, England to Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, Nairobi, Kenya. 
the flight had 379 passengers and 19 cabin crew on board. The cruise went on smoothly until they were three hours away from Nairobi. At around 5 a.m. when the flight was flying over Sudan airspace, both the captain, Hagan, and the first officer, Richard, went for a rest, leaving only the co-pilot inside the cockpit. A few minutes later, a tall man in his late 20s enters the cockpit, and what passengers hear next are banging sounds coming from the cockpit. And before you know it, the plane shot up to 42,000 feet before plummeting to 19,000 feet. It felt like a turbulence, but with this horrible noise, one passenger described. The cabin crew then rushed inside the cockpit only to meet the intruder had attacked the co-pilot and disconnected the autopilot. All we could see was the intruder's feet as they came out of the door and people were screaming. This woke Bynum who was traveling with his friend Gifford Shaw. Bynum who was seated at the business class then looked at Gifford and told him, we are gonna die. Gifford then looked at him and said, you are right. Bynum, in fear, looked out the window and could see the plane was going straight down. It was at that point he knew he had to do something. So, he got up and rushed to the cockpit. Gifford followed. As I opened the door, the assailant and the co-pilot were basically wrestling for the control wheel. The captain then entered the cockpit. By this time, a couple of others had come in and helped him get out of the control wheel. Fortunately, I was able to get my arms around his neck and shoulder and got him to the ground. Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? Flight attendant then handcuffed him. During the two-minute struggle, the intruder beat the captain's ear and finger. The assailant, however, did not respond to the questions and kept murmuring about having a companion even though he was traveling alone. Two hours later, the plane landed safely in Nairobi. You gotta do a superhero landing. Wait for it! Woo! Superhero landing! And only four passengers had minor injuries and one cabin crew had broken an ankle. The flight had survived two violent nose dives over Sudan. Altitude of 37,000 feet and our airspeed is 400 miles an hour. After landing in Nairobi, Paul Mukonyu was immediately transferred to the authorities. You're under arrest. So was Paul just making up stories to cover up his attempt to crash the plane? Or was he truly being followed by unknown men? Well, neither is true. Excuse me? Paul was diagnosed with a mental condition. Kenyan police spokesman at the time, Dollar Indidis, said the man should not be treated like a criminal. Paul was taken into Nairobi hospital and according to Dr. Jenga, we are of the very firm belief from this story that at no point did our patient contemplate the hijacking or doing harm to anyone. All he remembers is somebody hit him on the back and somebody put a finger in his eye. When he came, he was so frightened. To him, he was the one who was in danger. Paul was later diagnosed with a mental condition known as Paranoid Personality Disorder PPD. It is described as a mental health condition marked by a pattern of distrust and suspicion of others without adequate reason to be suspicious. 